Okay, so I'm delighted to introduce um, our first lot of invited speakers. And so we're going to have two invited speakers um, today. So starting off, um, we're going to have Ashish Vaswani, who's going to be talking about self-attention for generative models, and in particular, um, will introduce some of the work on transformers that he is well known for, along with his colleagues. Um, and then as a sort of um, a special edition, we're then also going to have Anna Huang um, talking about some applications of this work. There are actually at least a couple of people in the class who are actually interested in music applications. So this will be your one chance in the course <laughs> to see music applications of deep learning. OK, um, so I'll hand it over to Ashish. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks, Abby. Uh, Anna's actually here to make the class less dull, so she's the <laughs> highlight, not this guy. So, uh, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, um, excited to be here. This is a very large class. Uh, first uh, invited speaker, no pressure, so hopefully this will all go well. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the talk is going to be about uh, self attention. Um, and so the purpose is, is not going to be just to talk about a particular model. But as 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 empiricists and and like, well, I'm an empiricist and I consume machine learning to apply it to various tasks and 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 uh, a starting point always is to ask this question, you know, what are the what's the structure in my data set or what are the symmetries in my data set and and is there a model that exists that that's a very good that that has the inductive biases to model these properties that exist in my data set. So hopefully over the course of this uh, this this lecture. And, and I will convince you that uh, self-attention indeed does have some, has the ability to model some inductive biases that potentially could be useful for the problems that you care about. Um, so um, this talk is going to be on learning representations, primarily of uh, variable length data. Well, we have images, but uh, most of it is going to be variable length data. And, uh, and, and, and all of us care about this problem because well, in deep learning, deep learning is all about representation learning, and if, and Building the right tools for learning representations is is, the, is, is an important factor in in, uh, in achieving empirical success. Um, now, uh, the models of choice, the primary workhorse for perhaps even now and or up to this point, have been recurrent neural networks. Um, um, how many people here are familiar with RNNs? <laughs> okay, so. Definitely up to this point, the primary workhorse have been recurrent neural networks um, and some of the more, uh, some, uh, some gated variants that explicitly add multiplicative interactions like LSTMs, they also, they also have mechanisms that allow for better gradient transfer. And some recent variants like uh, gated uh, recurrent units that are simplification, they're kind of the, they're, they dominate this, this recurrent landscape. Um, and typically how do recurrent neural networks uh, learn or um, produce representations? They consume a string or a sentence, um, even an image. Imagine, you know, in a particular, in sequentially, and uh, at each at each uh, position, at each time step, they produce a they produce a, a continuous representation that's a summarization of of everything that they've actually crunched through. Um, now, so in, in the in the realm of large data. Uh, Having parallel models is, is quite is quite beneficial. In fact, I was actually reading Oliver Selfridge. Uh, he was a, he was a professor at MIT, and uh, he he had this uh, sort of he wrote the precursor to, to deep nets. It's called Pandemoniums. I would recommend everybody to read it. And he has this fascinating note that you know if you give me more parallel computation, I'll just add more data and make it slower, so you can consume more data. Um, uh, and and recurrence uh, recurrence sort of just by construction. Uh, Limits parallelization because you have to you have to wait until you're wait on, for a particular time point to produce the representation. Um, by the way, if there's any questions, please raise your hands. I'll hopefully look around and and uh, be able to attend to your question. Um, and again, and and now because we're actually producing these representations, we're sort of summarizing. You know, if you want to pass information, if you want to pass core reference information, then we kind of have to shove all of this inside this fixed size vector, so it could potentially be difficult to model and. Uh, while they've been successful in language, uh, explicit, they don't have, the architecture doesn't have a very clear explicit way to model hierarchy, which is, which is something that's very important in language. Um, now, um, 
So there have been, there have been, there's been excellent work, uh, uh, precursor to self-attention, that actually surmounted some of these difficulties. So what were these difficulties? Basically, it's like convolutional sequence models where you have these limited receptive field convolutions that, that again, consume the sentence, now not, not sequentially, but in depth. And uh, they produce representations for every, they produce representations of your variable length sequences. Um, and uh, they're trivial to parallelize because you can apply these convolutions simultaneously at every position. Each layer is trivial to parallelize. Uh, the, 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 the serial dependencies are only in the number of layers. Um, you can get, uh, you can, it, it, you can get these local dependencies efficiently because that a single application of a convolution can consume all the information inside its local receptive field. Um, now, if you want to have these really long distance interactions, while you don't have to ha pass through linear number of steps, you still, because these, because these receptive fields are local, you, you might need something like linear and depth or logarithmic if you're doing something like uh, dilated convolutions. So they still need the number of layers that are needed are still a function of the length of, the, uh, of, the, of your string. Uh, but they were a great development and they actually pushed a lot of research like wave RNN, for example, is a classic sort of success story of convolution, convolutional sequence models, even ByteNet. Um, now, so far, attention has been like one of the most important components, uh, the sort of content-based, you know, memory retrieval mechanism. And it's content-based because you have your decoder that attends to all this content that's your encoder and then just sort of decides what to what 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 information to absorb based on how similar this content is to every position in the memory so this has been a very critical mechanism in uh, in neural machine translation so now the question that we asked was like why why not just use attention for representations and uh, now here's what sort of a rough framework of this re this representation mechanism would look like uh, the way it just sort of repeating what attention is essentially now imagine you have you want to represent the word re-represent the word represent you want to construct its new representation and then first uh, you you attend or you you compare yourself you compare your content and in the beginning it could just be a word embedding you compare your content with all your words uh, with all with all the embeddings and based on these based on these compatibilities or these comparisons you produce a you produce a weighted combination of your entire neighborhood and based on that weighted combination you you summarize all that information so it's like you're re-expressing yourself in, in terms of a weighted combination of your entire neighborhood that's what attention does and you can add feed for layers to basically sort of compute new features for you um, now um, so the first part is going to be about how like some of the properties of self-attention actually help us in text generation, like what inductive biases are actually useful, and we empirically show that indeed they, they, they move the needle in text generation. And this is gonna be about machine translation, but there are other work also that uh, we'll talk about later. So now with, with, this, uh, with this sort of, uh, with this attention mechanism, we get, this, we get a constant path length, so all pairs all, a word can, a position can interact with any position, every position simultaneously. Um, hopefully, if the number of positions is not too many. Uh, attention just by virtue of like it's a construction. You have a softmax. You get these gating and multiplicative interactions. And again, I'm not going to be able to explain why, but it's it's interesting. Like you've seen these models. Like even even the uh, even pixel pixel CNN uh, or um, when it was actually modeling images, they explicitly had to add these multiplicative interactions inside the model to to basically beat RNNs. And attention just by construction gets this because you're you're multiplying the attention probabilities with your with your activations. It's trivial to parallel. Why? Because you can just do attention with MATMALs, uh, especially the variant that we use in our paper, uh, in our work. And uh, so now the question is, convolutional sequence, to, to convolutional sequence models have been very successful in, 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 in ge generative tasks for text. Can we actually do the same or achieve the same with, uh, with uh, attention as our primary workhorse for representation learning? Um, so just to sort of add some context, and there's been some there's been some, uh, up, to, up to the transformer, there had been a lot of great work on uh, using self-attention primarily for classification within, there was, some, there was a work on self-attention within the confines of like recurrent neural networks. Um, perhaps the closest to us is, the, is, is memory networks uh, by Weston Zukbatar, where they actually had a version of recurrent attention, but they didn't have, uh, but they didn't actually Empirically, they didn't show it to work on sort of conditional modeling like the uh, translation, and their mechanism was uh, like they, they were using sort of a fixed, they were using a fixed 
query at every step. So there was, it, it leaves something to be desired. It had, they still have this question, is it actually going to work um, on, on, on large scale machine translation systems or large scale text generation systems? So this is sort of the, the culmination of um, the, the, the self-attention, our self-attention work. This is the, the, and we put it together in the transformer model. And uh, so how does this look like? So we are going to use attention, we are going to use attention primarily for computing representations. So if your input, imagine you're doing English to German translation, so you have your words. And notice that uh, attention is uh, permutation invariant, so you just change the order of your positions, you change the order of your words and, and uh, it's not going to affect the actual output. So in, our, in order to maintain order, we add, we add position representations. And uh, there's two kinds that we tried in the paper, these, these fantastic sinusoids with Noam Shazir invented. Uh, and we also use learned representations, which are very plain vanilla. Both of them work equally well. Um, and uh, so, so first we have, so the encoder looks as follows, right? So we have a self-attention layer that just recomputes the representation uh, for every position simultaneously using attention. Then we have a feed forward layer, and we also have residual, uh, residual connections. And I'll, I'll sort of give you a glimpse of what these residual connections might be bringing. That is between every, every layer and the input, we have a skip connection that just adds the activations. Uh, and then this tuple of uh, self-attention and feed forward layer just essentially repeats. Now on the decoder side, uh, we, we, uh, we have a sort of standard encoder decoder architecture. On the decoder side, we mimic a language model using self-attention. And the way to mimic a language model using self-attention is to impose causality by just masking out the positions that you can look at. So basically, the, the first position, it's Ill, it can't look forward. It's illegal to look forward. It can look at itself because we actually shift the input. Um, so it's not copying. Um, it's kind of surprising with, the with these models, it's very easy to copy at one point when early on, it was even hard to you know, do copying with recurrent models, but now at least we can copy really well, which is a positive sign, I think, overall. Um, but uh, so now on the decoder side, uh, we, have, uh, we have this causal self-attention layer followed by encoder-decoder attention, where we actually attend to the uh, last layer of the encoder and a feed-forward layer, and this triple repeats a, a few times, and at the end, we have the standard cross-entropy loss. Um, and, um, so, um, sort of staring at the at, at our at the particular variant of the self of the attention mechanism that, mechanism that we use, we went for both we went for simplicity and speed. So, um, so how do you actually compute attention? So, imagine you want to re-represent the position e two, and uh, we are going to first linearly linearly transform it into uh, a query, and then we're going to linearly transform every position in your neighborhood, or let's say every position at the input, because this is the, uh, on the encoder side, to a, a key. And these linear transformations can actually be thought as features, and I'll talk more about it later on. So it's like, it's, it's basically a bilinear form. You're projecting these vectors into a space where dot product is a good, where just a dot product is a good proxy for similarity. Okay, so now you have your logit, so you just do a softmax computer convex combination, and now based on this convex combination, you're going to then re-express E2, or in terms of this convex combination of all the vectors of all these positions. And before doing, before doing the convex combination, we again do a linear transformation to produce values. And then we do a second linear transformation just to mix this information and pass it through a, pass it through a feed forward layer. And this is, um, and all of this can be expressed basically in two, uh, in, two, in two matrix multiplications. And the square root factor is just to make sure that these, these dot products don't blow up. It's just a scaling factor. And, uh, and, and why is this particular, why is this mechanism attractive? Well, it's just really fast. You can do this very quickly on a GPU. And sim you can do it simultaneously for all positions uh, with just two MATMLs and a softmax. Um, and on the decoder side, it's, it's exactly the same except we impose causality by just adding 10e my, uh, minus 10e9 to the logits. So it bas it's just, you just get zero probabilities on those positions. So we just impose causality by, by adding these uh, highly negative values on the attention, on the attention logits. Um, is, is everything? <laughs> I thought that was a question. So, um, <laughs> Okay, so attention is really, uh, attention is cheap. So because, it's, because this variant of attention just involved two, involves two matrix multiplications, it's quadratic in the length of your sequence. Uh, and now what's the computational profile of 
RNNs or convolutions, they're quadratic in the dimension. Because basically, you can just think of a convolution just flattening your input and just applying a linear transformation on top of it, right? So, and when does this actually become very attractive? This becomes very, very attractive when your dimension is uh, much larger than your length which is the case for machine translation. Now we will talk about cases when, when, the, when this is not true, then we have to, we have to, do, we have to make other model developments. Um, but, uh, but for short sequences or sequences where your length does, where your dimension dominates length, attention is a very, has a very favorable computation profile. And as you can see, it's about four times faster than an RNN um, um, and, and faster than a convolutional model where the, you have a kernel of like filter width uh, three. So, so, there's still one problem. Now, here's something, so in, in language, typically we want to know like who did what to whom, right? So now imagine you applied a convolutional filter because you actually have different linear transformations based on relative distances. Like these, this, this, this linear transformation on the word who, uh, on, on the concept, can, have, can learn this concept of who and, and, and pick out different information from this embedding of the word I. And this linear transformation, the, the red linear transformation can pick out different information from kicked. And the blue linear transformation can pick out different, different information from ball. Now, when you have a single attention layer, this is difficult because all because it's just a convex combination and you have the same linear transformation everywhere, all that's available to you is just, a, is just mixing proportions. So you can't pick out different pieces of information from different places. Well, what if we had one attention layer for who? So you can think of an attention layer as something like a feature detector almost, like because a particular, it, it, it might try to, it might, because it carries with it a linear transformation, so it's projecting them in a space that, which starts caring maybe about syntax, or it's projecting in a space which starts caring about who or what. Uh, then we can have another attention layer for, or attention head for what, did what, and other, another attention head for, for, for whom, to whom. And, all of this can actually be done in parallel, and that's actually and that's exactly what we do. And for efficiency, instead of actually having these dimensions operate in, in a large space, we just we just reduce the dimensionality of all these heads, and we operate these attention layers in parallel, sort of bridging the gap. Now, here's a uh, perhaps. Well, here's a little quiz. I mean, can you actually? Is there a combination of heads? Or is there a configuration in which you can actually exactly simulate a convolution, probably with more parameters? I think there should be a simple way to show that if you had more heads or heads were a function of positions, you could probably just simulate a convolution, but although with a lot of parameters. Uh, so it can, in, in, in the limit, it can actually simulate a convolution. Uh, and, and also, you can all, we can continue to enjoy the benefits of parallelism. But we did increase the number of softmaxes because each head then carries with it a softmax. But the amount of flops didn't change because we, instead of actually having these heads operate in very large dimensions, they're operating in very small dimensions. Um, so uh, when we applied this on, on, on machine translation, um, we were able to uh, dramatically outperform uh, previous results on English, German, and English, French translation. So we had a pretty standard setup, 32,000 word vocabularies, word piece encodings, uh, WMT, uh, WMT 2014 uh, was our test set, 2013 to the dev set. And, uh, and some of these results were much stronger than even our previous ensemble models. And, um, and on English French also we had some we had some very favorable favorable results uh, and we and we, we 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 achieved state of the art. Now just stepping back a bit, uh, I, I'm not claiming that we we arrived at an architecture that has better expressivity than an LSTM. I mean there's 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 theorems that that say that LSTMs can model any function. Um, perhaps all we did was just build an architecture that was good for SGD. Uh, because stochastic gradient descent could just train this architecture really well because the gradient dynamics and attention are very simple. Attention is just a linear combination. And uh, um, I, think that's, I, I think that's actually favorable, but hopefully uh, as, we, as we go on, but well, I, I'd also like to point out that you know, we, do explicit, we do explicitly model all, all path connections, all, all, all pairwise connections, and it has this adv advantage of uh, very clear, modeling very clear relationships directly between, between any two words. Um, and like, hopefully we'll be able to also show that there are other inductive biases that it's not just like building architectures that, that are good for, that are good inductive biases for SGD. Um, so frameworks, a lot of our work was initially pushed out in tensor to tensor. Maybe that might change in the future with the arrival of JAX. There's, an, there's a framework also from Amazon called Sockeye. There's also FairSeq, uh, the, the convolutional sequence to sequence toolkit from Facebook that uh, the probably, I'm actually not sure if it has a transform implementation, but they have some really good uh, sequence to sequence models as well. 
Um, OK, so the importance of residuals. So uh, we have these residual, residual connections uh, between, um, uh, so we have these residual connections that go from here to here, to here, here to here, like between every pair of layers. And it's interesting. So, be, um, we, so what we do is we just add the position informations at the input to the model. And uh, we, don't infuse, we don't infuse or we don't inject position information at every layer. So when uh, we severed these residual connections and we looked, stared, at these, uh, stared at these attention distributions, which is the center, sort of the middle map is this attention distribution, you actually basically, it, it's been unable to pick this diagonal. It should have a very strong diagonal focus. And so what has happened was these residuals were carrying this position information to every layer. And because these subsequent layers had no notion of position, they were finding it hard to actually attend. This is the encoder-decoder attention, which typically ends up being diagonal. Now, so then we, we said, OK, so then we actually continued, we continued to sever the residuals, but we added position information back in at every layer. We injected position information back in. And we didn't recover the accuracy, but we did get some of this sort of diagonal focus back in. So the residuals are doing more, but they're certainly definitely moving this position information to the model. They're, they're pumping this position information through the model. Um, OK, so, so, that was, that was, so, so now we saw that you know, being able to sort of model both long and short-term short relationships uh, sh uh, long, long and short distance relationships with, uh, with attention is beneficial for, for text generation. Um, what kind of inductive, inductive biases like, actually uh, appear, or what, what kind of phenomena appear in images? And something that we constantly see, constantly see in images and music is this notion of uh, repeating structure that's very similar to each other. You have these motifs that repeat in, in different scales. So for example, there's, this, there's another artificial but beautiful example of self-similarity where you have this Van Gogh painting where this texture or this, these little objects just repeat. These images are, these different pieces of the image are very similar to each other, but they might have different scales. Uh, again, in music, here's a motif that repeats. Uh, it, could have, it could have like various like spans of time between, in, in between it. So, um, so, so this, so we, we, we attempted after this to see, well, to ask this question, can self-attention help us in modeling other objects like images? So the, the path we took was sort of standard autoregressive image modeling, the uh, probabilistic image modeling, not GANs, um, uh, because it was, well, one, it was very easy. We had a language model almost. So this is just like language modeling on images. Uh, and also training at maximum likelihood allows you to sort of measure, measure how well you're doing on, uh, on, on your held out set. Uh, and it also gives you diversity, so hopefully you're covering all possible uh, different kinds of images. You, so, um, and to this point, there's all, we had an advantage that also been, there had been good work on using recurrent models like PixelRN and PixelCNN that, that were actually getting some very good compression rates. Um, and um, again, here, originally the argument was that, well, you know, in images, because they're, because you want symmetry, because you want, like, if you have a face, you want, you want one ear to sort of match with the other. If you had a, a large receptive field, which you could potentially get with attention at a lower computational cost, then it should benefit, and then it should be quite beneficial for, for images, uh, for images, and you wouldn't need many layers like you do in convolutions to actually get dependencies between these far away pixels. So it seemed like self-attention would have been a, would have, would have, would have, would have, was already a good computational mechanism, right? But this sort of, but it was actually interesting to see how it even modeled, naturally modeled self-similarity. And people have used self-similarity in image generation, like, you know, uh, this is this really cool work by Efros where they actually see, okay, in the training set, what are those patches that are really that are really similar to me? And based on the patches that are really similar to me, I'm gonna fill up the information. So it's like actually doing image generation. Uh, there's this really classic work called non-local means, where they do image denoising, where they wanna denoise this sort of, this patch, uh, P, and they say, I'm going to, based on my similarity between all other patches in my image, I'm going to compute some function of content-based similarity, and based on the similarity, I'm going to pool information. So, and, and, and exploiting this fact that images are very self-similar. And uh, um, this has also been sort of uh, applied in some recent work. Now, if you just took this encoder self-attention mechanism and just replace these word embeddings with patches, and that's kind of exactly what it's doing. It's, it's computing this notion of content-based similarity between these elements, and then based on this content-based similarity, it constructs a convex combination that essentially brings these things together. So it's, it's a very, na it, was, it was quite, it was very pleasant to see that, well, this is a differentiable way of doing non-local means. And, uh, and uh, we took the transformer architecture and uh, replaced words with pixels. Uh, there, were some, there were some architecture adjustments to do. 
And uh, so this was, but this was basically the kind of, it was very similar to the original work. And here the position representations, instead of being, you know, one dimensional, they were, because we were not dealing with sequences, we had two dimensional position representations. Um, okay, so I pointed out before, attention has a very, very favorable computational profile if your length, if your dimension dominates length, which is, ab which is absolutely untrue for absolutely untrue for images, um, because even for like 32, but even for 32 by 32 images, when you flatten them and you if you flatten them, you get 32, you get 3072 positions. Uh, so it's your standard CFAR image. Um, so a simple solution, uh, because like convolutions of, I mean, you get convolutions have basically looked at local windows and you get translational equivariance. We said, okay, let's adopt the same strategy. And also, there's a lot of spatial locality in images. Uh, but now, we will still have a better computational profile. If your, if your receptive field is still smaller than your dimension, you can afford, you can actually still do much more long distance computation than a standard convolution because your, uh, because your uh, quadratic in length. So as long as we didn't increase our length beyond the dimension, we still had a favorable computational profile. And so the way we did it was uh, we essentially had uh, two kinds of rasterizations. So we had a one-dimensional rasterization. We had a sort of single query block, uh, which, was, um, which was then attending or to the, into a larger memory block uh, in this rasterized fashion along the, along, along the rows. Um, then we tried another form of rasterization, following standard two-dimensional locality, where, you had, where we actually produced the image in, uh, in blocks, and within each block we had a rasterization scheme. Um, again, this, this image transformer layer was very similar. We had uh, two-dimensional position representations, along with, with, the same, with a very similar attention mechanism. Um, and uh, we tried both super resolution and unconditional and conditional image generation. Uh, this was... Uh, this was uh, Nikki, Pramar, I, and a, couple, and a few other authors from uh, Brain, um, and uh, we presented at ICML, and uh, we were able to achieve better perplexity than existing models. So Pixel Snail is actually another model that used mixed both convolutions and self-attention, and they, they outperformed us on, 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 on bits per dimension. So we were measuring perplexity because these are probabilistic, mo these are probabilistic models. It's like basically a language model of images, and, and, it just, and, your, and the factorization of your language model just depends on how you rasterize. In the, in, the, in the 1D rasterization, we went first rows and then columns. In the 2D rasterization, we went blockwise, and inside each block we rasterized. On ImageNet, we achieve better perplexities, and uh, so yeah. I mean, we're not at GAN level, right? I mean, this, we're, this is uh, I think probabilist autoregressive image generation um, by this point had not reached GANs. Uh, at iClear 2019, there's a paper by Nal that actually uses self-attention and gets very very good quality images. But what we what we observed was we were getting structured objects fairly well. Like, can people recognize what the second row is? I, I said most, almost everyone said cars. I'm not going to ask who said something else, but yes, they're cars. Yeah, and uh, so the and the last row is another vehicle. Like uh, so, essentially, when we, structured structured objects were easy to capture, um, like frogs and sort of you know objects that were camouflaged just turned into this mush. Um, and uh, but on super resolution now super resolution is interesting because there's a lot of conditioning information right, and uh, when you have a lot of conditioning information, the the, the sort of possible you break you you actually lock a, quite a few of the modes. So there's only a few options you can have at the output. And super our super resolution results were much better. We were able to get uh, better facial orientation and structure than previous work, and these are samples at different temperatures, and uh, and. Um, and we, when we quantified this with actual human evaluators, we like we flashed an image and said, "Is this real? Is this false?" And we were able to uh, we were able to fool humans like four times better than previous results on super resolution. Again, these are not these results are like I, I guess the latest GAN result from Nvidia makes this look like a joke. But I mean, this is I mean we're starting later than GAN, so hopefully we'll catch up. But but the point here is that this is an interesting inductive bias for images. It's a very natural inductive bias for images. Um, and, uh, and, and there is hope to apply it for applying it in classification and other such tasks also. Um, so one interesting thing, just to sort of both out of curiosity and asking how good is maximum, like does maximum likelihood, well one, does the model actually capture some interesting structure in the world? 
Second, do you get diversity? Well, maximum likelihood should get diversity by, by, virtue, by virtue of what it does. Uh, so then we just we did image completion. And it, why, is, why image completion? Because as soon as you lock down half the image to the gold truth, you're actually shaving off a lot of the possible modes. So you have a much easier time sampling. So, uh, so the first is, uh, first is what we supplied to the model. The, 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 right row, the, the rightmost column is, is gold. And we were able to generate different samples. But what was really interesting is the third row. Uh, so the rightmost column is, the rightmost column is gold. Uh, now, if you look at the third row of this horse, so actually there's this sort of glimpse or a suggestion of a pull, but the model hallucinated a human in some of these, in some of these images, which is interesting. Like it, it does capture, or at least the data teaches it to capture some structure about the world. Um, the dog is just cute, and I guess it also shows that you know, there was this entire object, this chair, that the model just completely refused to imagine. So there's a lot of difficulty. Uh, and I guess Anna's going to talk about uh, the, another way to exploit self-similarity. Uh, self Thank you. So thank you, Ashish, for the introduction. Uh, so there's a lot of self-similarity in images. There's also a lot of self-similarity in, in music. So we can imagine Transformer being a, a good model for it. Uh, we, we're going to show how uh, we can add more to, uh, to the self-attention to think more about kind of relational information and how that could help uh, music generation. <coughs> So uh, first, I want to clarify what is the raw representation that we're working with right now. So analogous to language, you can think about there is text, and somebody is reading out a text. So they add their kind of own intonations to it, and then you have sound waves coming out. That's speech. So for music, there's a very, very similar kind of uh, line of uh, generation where you say the composer has an idea, uh, writes down the score, and then a performer performs it, and then you get sound. So what we're going to focus on today is mostly, um, you can think of the score, but it's actually a, a performance um, in that it's uh, a symbolic representation where MIDI uh, pianos were used and uh, am uh, professional amateur uh, musicians were performing uh, on the pianos. So we have the recorded uh, information of their playing. So in particular, um, at each time step, uh, modeling music as this uh, sequential uh, process, what is being output are, OK, turn this note on, uh, advance the clock by this much, and then turn this note off. And also, there is uh, dynamics information. So when you turn the note on, you first say, like, how loud it's going to be. Uh, so traditionally, uh, modeling uh, music as kind of a language, uh, we've been using uh, recurrent neural networks. And um, because, as she introduced uh, and, and talked about, there is a lot of compression that needs to happen. Like a long sequence has to be embedded into like a fixed length uh, vector, and that becomes hard when uh, in music you have you have repetition coming um, at a distance. So uh, I'm first going to show you um, samples from from the RNNs from a transformer, and then from music transformer that has the relative attention, and kind of let you hear the differences. And then I'll go into how we uh, what are, what are, what are the uh, modifications we needed to do on top of the uh, transformer model. Uh, so here. Uh, this task is kind of the image completion task. So we give it an initial motif, and then we ask the model to do continuations. So this is the motif that we fed. How many people recognize the? Awesome, OK. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a kind of a fragment from a, a Chopin etude piece. And we're going to ask uh, the RNN to do a continuation. So you can hear, like, in the beginning, it was trying to repeat it, but very fast, it uh, wandered off into its uh, other different ideas. So that's one challenge, because it's uh, not able to directly look back to what happened in the past. 
uh, and, and can just look at kind of a bl blurry version, and that blurry version becomes more and more blurry. Uh, so this is what the transformer does. Uh, so so uh, a, a detail is uh, these models are trained on half the length that you're hearing. So we're kind of asking the model to generalize beyond the length that it's trained on. And you can see for the transformer, it, it deteriorates beyond that. But it can hold the motif pretty consistent. Okay, you, you, get, you get the idea. <laughs> so initially, it was able to do this repetition really well. Uh, so it was able to copy very well. But beyond the length it was trained on, it kind of didn't know how to cope with like longer context. And uh, what you see, uh, the, the, the last one is from the music transformer that thinks about kind of the relational information. And you can just see visually how it's very consistent in kind of repeating these, these larger uh, arcs. Yeah, so that was uh, Music Transformer. And so in music, the, the self-similarity that we talked about, uh, so we see uh, the motif here. So, so there we primed the model with a motif. And this is actually a sample, unconditioned sample from the model. So nothing, uh, there was no priming. But the uh, model kind of had to create its own motif and then uh, do uh, continuations from there. And here, uh, if we kind of look at it and analyze it a bit, you see uh, a lot of uh, repetition at, uh, with gaps in between. And if you look at the self-attention structure, we actually do see the model uh, looking at the relevant parts, even if, if it was not immediately uh, preceding it. So, so here, uh, what I colored, shaded out, is where the motif um, occurs. Uh, and you can uh, see the different colors is the different attention heads, and they're kind of focusing uh, among those uh, grayed out sections. <coughs> so I'll play you the sample, and we also have a visualization that kind of shows you, as the music is, uh, is being played, uh, what notes it was attending to as it was predicting that note. And uh, this was generated from scratch. And uh, so the self-attention is um, from, from kind of note to note level or event to event level. So it's, it's quite low level. Uh, so when you look at it, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming. It has like multiple heads and a lot of things moving. Uh, but there's kind of these structural moments where you would kind of see more of this uh, clean uh, kind of uh, uh, sections where it's attending to. Um, how, how did we do that? Uh, so starting from kind of the, the regular attention mechanism, we know it's uh, a weighted average of the past history. Uh, and the nice thing is, uh, however far it is, we have direct access to it. So if we know uh, there are uh, kind of motifs that occurred uh, in, in the early on in the piece, we're still able to, based on uh, the fact that things are similar, uh, to be able to retrieve those. Um, but uh, it also becomes, all the past becomes kind of a bag of words. Like there's no structure of which came uh, before or after. So there's the positional sinusoids that she's talked about that uh, basically indes, uh, indices, indexes into uh, sinusoids that are moving at different speeds. And so close by positions would have a very similar kind of cross section into those multiple sinusoids. Uh, in contrast, for, for convolutions, you kind of have this uh, fixed filter that's moving around that uh, captures the relative distance, like one before, two before. And these are kind of uh, 
in some ways like a rigid structure that allows you to be uh, kind of bring in the the distance information very explicitly. Um, you can imagine relative attention um, with the multiple heads uh, at play uh, to be some combination of these. So uh, on one hand, you can access uh, the, the history very directly. On the other hand, you also know how you re relate to this history, uh, capturing, for example, like translational invariance. And, uh, and we, uh, and for example, we think one of the reasons why in the beginning uh, prime example is that you heard that the uh, music transformer was able to generate beyond the length it was trained on in a very coherent way is that it's able to kind of rely on this translational invariance to, to carry uh, the relational information forward. So if we take a closer look at how, 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 the, how this works is uh, the regular transformer you have, you compare all the queries and keys, so you get kind of this uh, square matrix. You can think of it as like a self-similarity uh, matrix, so it's a, a square. Uh, what relative attention does is to add an additional term that thinks, uh, that thinks about whenever you're comparing two things, how far are you apart? And also based on the content, do I, do I care about things that are two steps away or three steps away, or I maybe care about things that are recurring at kind of a periodical distance? And uh, with that information gathered, that influences uh, the, the similarity between positions. And in particular, uh, this extra term is based on um, the distance. So you want to uh, gather the embeddings uh, that's relevant to the, uh, the, the query key distances uh, on, the, on the logits. So in translation, this uh, has shown uh, a lot of improvement in, um, in for example, English to, to German translation. Uh, but in translation, the sequences are usually quite short. It's only a sentence-to-sentence -sentence, uh, translation, for example, uh, maybe 50 words or 100 words. But the music uh, samples that you've heard are in the range of 2,000 time subs. So it's like 2,000 tokens need to be able to fit in memory. So this was a problem uh, because the original formulation relied on building this 3D tensor that's uh, uh, that's very large in memory. Um, and, and why this is the case, it's because for every pair, uh, you, you look up what the, what the so you can compute what the relative distance is, and then you look up an embedding that corresponds to that distance. So um, for like this, this uh, length by length, like L by L uh, matrix, you need like a, to collect embeddings for each of the positions, and that's uh, depth D. So that gives us the 3D. What we realize is you can actually just directly multiply the queries and the embedding distances, and they uh, come out kind of in a different order because now you have the queries ordered by relative distance, but you need the queries ordered by keys, uh, which is kind of an absolute by absolute uh, configuration. So what we could do is just uh, do a series of skewing uh, to, to put it into the right uh, configuration. And this is, uh, yeah, just a, just a quick contrast to, to show um, the difference in memory requirements. So uh, a lot of times the challenge is, is in uh, being able to scale, uh, be, being able to be more memory efficient so that you can model longer sequences. So with that, uh, this is, um, I can play you one more sample if we have time, but if we don't have time, we can go ahead. OK, so this is, this is maybe a one, uh, about a one minute sample, and I, uh, I hope you like it. Thanks. <laughs>
Thank you for listening. Leaving or something. Oh. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anna. Um, um, great. Um, so, just sort of to. Um, so, relative attention has been a powerful mechanism for um, um, a very powerful mechanism for music. It's also helped in machine translation. Um, one really interesting uh, consequence of, uh, of um, one really interesting consequence of relative attention in uh, in images is that um, like convolutions achieve uh, convolutions achieve translational equivariance. So, if you have let's say you want um, you have this. It, this, this red dot or this feature that you're computing at this red dot, it doesn't depend on where this image of the dog is in the image, uh, is in, in, in the larger image. It just doesn't, doesn't depend on its absolute location. It's going, to, it's going to produce the same activation. So you have convolutions have this nice uh, translation equivariance. Now with, with, with relative uh, positions or relative attention, you get exactly the same effect because you don't have any, once you just remove this notion of absolute position that you're injecting into the model, uh, once you've once you've removed that, then your attention computation, because it actually includes. I mean, we've, we've, uh, Nikki and I and a couple others of you actually uh, and Anna, we were actually working on images and it seems and it seems to actually show uh, better results. Um, this actually this now satisfies this. Uh, uh, the, I mean, it, it, it can achieve translation equivariance, which is a great property for images. So there's a lot of, it seems like this might be an interesting direction to pursue if you want to push um, self-attention in images for self-supervised learning. Um, I guess on, on self-supervised learning, so the generative, the generative modeling work that, that I talked about before, in and itself, just having probabilistic models of images is, I mean, I guess the best model of an image is I, I go to Google search and I pick up an image and I just give it to you. But I, I guess generative models of images are useful because if you want to do something like semi uh, or self supervised learning where you just pre train a model on a lot of on a lot of unlabeled data and then you transfer it. So hopefully this is going to help and this is going to be a part of that machinery. Um, another interesting uh, uh, another interesting structure that relative attention allows you to model is uh, is is kind of a graph. So imagine you had this uh, you had this similarity graph where these red edges are, are are this notion of companies and the blue edges this notion of a fruit uh, and um, an apple takes these two forms and uh, and you could just imagine relative attention just modeling this just being able to model or being able to uh, you, you, you yourself being able to impose these different notions of similarity uh, between uh, between different elements uh, so if you have like if you have graph problems um, then uh, relative self attention might be a good fit for you um, there's also there's also some a, quite a, a position paper by Batalia et al from DeepMind that talks about relative attention and how it can be used um, within graphs. Um, so while we're on graphs, I just wanted to, it perhaps might be interesting to connect um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, excellent work that was done on, uh, on graphs called message passing neural networks. And it's quite funny. So if you look at, if you look at the message passing function, um, what it's saying is we're actually just passing messages between pairs of nodes. So you can just think of self-attention as imposing a fully connect. It's like a, a, full, a, a complete bipartite graph, and uh, you're you're passing messages between you're passing messages between nodes. Now, message passing message passing neural networks did exactly that. They were passing messages between nodes as well. And how are they different? Well, the only way that, I mean, well, mathematically they were only different in that message passing was was uh, forcing the messages to be between pairs of nodes, but just because of the softmax function where you get interaction between all the nodes, self-attention is like a message passing mechanism where the interactions are between all, all nodes. So uh, they're, they're, like, they're not too far mathematically. And also, the, me the message passing paper introduces an interesting concept called multiple towers that are similar to multi-head attention uh, that, that Noam invented. And uh, it's like you run K copies of these message passing neural networks in parallel. So there's a lot of similarity between existing, you know, th this connects to work that existed before, but these connections sort of came in later. Um, we have a graph library where we kind of connected these, both, both these strands, message passing, and uh, we, we, uh, we put it out in tensor to tensor. Um, so to sort of summarize, um, the properties that self-attention has been able to help us model is this constant path length between any two, any two positions, and it's 
It's been, it's been shown to be quite useful in, 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 uh, in sequence modeling. This advantage of having unbounded memory, not having to pack information in finite, in, in, in a sort of finite amount of, in a, in a fixed amount of space, uh, where, and in, in our case, our memory essentially grows with the sequences, is, 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 helps you computationally. Uh, it's trivial to parallelize. You can, you can crunch a lot of data, it's, um, which is useful if you want to have, you have large data sets. We found that it can model self-similarity. Uh, it seems to be a very natural thing. Uh, very, a very natural phenomena if you're dealing with images or music. Also, relative attention allows you to sort of gives you this added dimension of being able to model expressive timing and music, well, this translation like covariance. Uh, it extends very naturally to graphs. Um, so, this part or everything that I talked so far was about sort of parallel training. Um, so there's a very active area of research now using these self-attention models for, for, for less autoregressive generation. So notice I, at generation time, notice that the decoder mask was causal. We couldn't look into the future. So we're, when, we're, when we're generating, we're still generating sequentially left to right on the target side. Um, so, um, and, 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 and why, why is generation hard? Well, because your outputs are multimodal. If you had, if you want to translate English to German, there are multiple ways, and 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 your your second word that you're translating will depend on the first word. For example, if you if you first the, the first word that you predict was Danke, then that's going to change the second word that you predict. And if you just predicted them independently, then you can imagine you can just have all sorts of permutations of these, which will be incorrect. Uh, and the way we actually break modes is, is, or we make decisions, is just sequential generation. Once we commit to a word, that that makes a decision, and then that nails down what's the next word that you're going to predict. So there's been some there's been some work on uh, it's an active research area, uh, and you can kind of categorize some of these papers like the non-autoregressive transformer of the fast the third paper fast decoding um, the fourth paper towards a better understanding of vector quantized autoencoders into this group where they're actually doing the decision making in a latent space that's being uh, it's e either being learned using word alignments uh, fertilities or it's being learned using Autoencoder. So you make you do the decision making in latent space, and then you once you've made the decisions in latent space, you assume that all your outputs are actually conditionally independent, given that you've made these decisions. So that's how they actually speed up. There's also uh, there's an, there's another paper. The second one is a paper that does iterative refinement. There's also a blockwise parallel decoding uh, paper by Mitchell Stern, uh, Noam Shazir, and, and Jakob Eskreit. Uh, where they essentially just run multiple models like um, and rescore using a more uh, they decode using a faster model and score using the more expensive model. So that's how it sort of it speeds it up. Um, transfer learning has had a, the, the self attention has been beneficial in transfer learning. GPT from OpenAI and BERT are two classic examples. There's been some work on actually scaling this up, like add a factor as a efficient optimizer. Um, there's, a, there's a recent paper by uh, Rohan Anil and Yoram Singer. Um, there's also Mesh TensorFlow, which actually uh, they've been able to train uh, models uh, which are s several orders of magnitude larger than the original models have been trained. So there's, I mean, when you're working in this large data regime, you probably want to memorize a lot of, you want to memorize a lot of things inside your parameters, you just train a larger model. Uh, Mesh TensorFlow can, allow, can let you do that. Um, there's been a lot of interesting work. Universal transformers, sort of recurrent neural networks, can actually count very nicely. So if you this, these cute papers by uh, Schmidt Huber, where you actually show that recurrent neural, the count, the cell mechanism just learns a nice counter. Like if you're, you can learn kind of a to the n, b to the n uh, with LSTMs. So then uh, universal transformers brings back recurrence in depth inside the transformer. Uh, there's a really cool Wikipedia paper. Um, simultaneously with the image transformer paper that also uses local attention, transformer XL is this paper that sort of combines recurrence with self-attention. So they do self-attention in chunks, but they sort of summarize history by using recurrence. It's kind of cute. It's been used in speech, but I don't know if there's been some really big success stories of self-attention in speech. Uh, again, similar issues where you have very large uh, um, uh, positions to, uh, to do self-attention over. So yeah, um, self-supervision is, uh, is a, if it works, it would, be, it, would be, it would be very beneficial. We wouldn't need large label data sets. Understanding transfer, transfer is becoming, very, uh, becoming, a, is becoming a reality in NLP with BERT and some of these other models. So understanding how these, what's actually happening is, a, is an interesting area of ongoing research for me and a couple of, and a few of my collaborators. And uh, multitask learning and surmounting this, this quadratic problem with self-attention is an interesting area of research that, I, that I'd like to pursue. Thank you. Uh, yeah.